we've returned from our production trip to Egypt and Jordan, filming two of our most ambitious and exciting projects to date. In this episode, we dive deep into how the production went, what were some of the challenges that we experienced, and we'll pull back the curtain on logistics and talk equipment. That's coming up next on Inroads. Welcome to Inroads, where we share real world examples of digital evangelism and provide tips on how you can use today's technology to spread the gospel. You can learn more about us and watch our free video series at appianmedia.org. Appian Media is currently in post production of our next documentary series, Out of Egypt. You're invited on this extraordinary journey through Egypt and Jordan as we look at one of the possible routes of the Exodus. We'll share more about how you can still be involved with this incredible project later in the show. Stu, we are back. We are back. How's the jet lag feeling? You had enough time to yeah work um, through that it was it it took a few days i you know only a few days <laughs> only a few days uh the flight back was not bad though i'll say we yeah. got a direct flight from amman jordan to uh chicago and that was nice because it was 12 hours i'm not sure if we were going through the day or the night or whatever i was not awake through most of that uh, particular flight you know those international flights i don't know about you um uh, there's a whole lot of like uh going uh, dozing off, being unconscious, and then waking up in the middle of some movie <laughs> that I really don't care to see. I'm just like, oh, it's on I need something. watching something and then, you know, falling asleep again. So it's like, it's just this. <laughs> and then they'll bring you food every once in a while and yes. then you just kind of eat and watch. It's a weird There is something magical place. about it. You do kind of wake up and you're like, there. There's food. There's here. food in front I know. of me. I think it's food. Yeah. Depending on where you're flying. But nowhere uh, else in my life do I do I operate that way. Where right. I'm just like on the couch watching Netflix or something, going <laughs> and then wake up and there's food in front of me and I eat and then I just watch and then I'm I mean, like that just does not happen. That's, that's not your that's, life? It's not my life. Is it not? Okay, well. Right. But it is when you're, you know, thirty thousand feet over the Atlantic Ocean. And I don't know about you, that was the long the single longest longest flight I've ever taken. I think it was. From so it's some, something like 12, 12 and a half hours. Yeah. And uh, man, I thought before we, we went on the trip, oh, it's going to be the longest 12 hours of my life. Yeah. I don't know. Um, we worked so hard and we were so exhausted by the end yeah. of that trip that seriously, I remember closing my eyes and waking up and we had about an hour left to fly. Yeah. Like it was. Wow. That's good. It was a great flight. That's good. You, it was a great yeah. flight. That's what Barry said too. He said that, um, and he had a different flight. He took different legs. I think he went to Paris or something like that. But he said that when he got on his flight, he told the stewardess to wake him up to eat <laughs> and he fell asleep and like they landed or something. And the, the stewardess told him, we tried to wake you up, <laughs> but you were just so out of it. Yeah. It so. just means we worked him real hard. Yeah. Poor Barry. That's right. Um, now, Barry, you mentioned that Barry had a, a unique experience with us because he was only able to join us for about half of the trip. That's correct. So he flew home from Egypt on the same day that the rest of our team flew into Jordan. And uh, so to the Sinai, to the Sinai Peninsula. Peninsula. Mm -hmm. You're right. 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 Um, this is why. This is why we're having uh, at least one of these episodes yeah. where we can kind of talk ourselves through the trip. Um, and, uh, and share with you guys what, uh, what it was like. And it'll also kind of help me make I, sense of I what think, just happened. Yeah. I think it's cleansing. Um, you know, yeah. and, and I know since we've been back, uh, people have come up to us and asked, Hey, how was the trip? Was They're it? looking for some really like grandiose, like, Oh, it was amazing. It was just a great experience or whatever the case is. And you know, it's it was just so complicated. There were so many levels to it. Yeah. This will be a piece of content we can tell people, go listen just to this go episode. Listen. Go, go listen to this you episode. Know. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, when someone comes up to you and they see that you have children and they're like, what's it like being a parent? Well, I <laughs> How do you can't sum that answer up? that, that you sum 15 that seconds, exactly. you know? <laughs> it's amazing. It's frustrating. It's, it's the you know, the single greatest experience right, of my there's life. there's a lot of laughing, but a lot I of crying. But I also pull it's my like, hair out yeah, sometimes. Right. Um, That's the way this feels, And that, that was Egypt, where, man, I'm glad we got to do it. Right. And what a trip. I mean, what a blessing. Mm -hmm. The fact that we were even able to do it was because of 350-plus people yeah. who 
asked us to do it, who gave us the means to do it, and that's incredible. But as we'll talk about in this episode, it was also, at some points, excruciatingly difficult. Yeah. And easily some of the most challenging things our team has ever done that we've put our team through. <laughs> um, it, you know, and but I would do it again. Yeah, I would too. I would I would, you know, it takes a few weeks to say that. That's true. But um, I would too. And you know, we'll, I think we'll dive deep here in a few minutes about the the whole project and kind of go through the the timeline. But um, it, on any given day, we ran into hurdles that if they had happened on previous trips, we'd have been like, this is the end of the world. But by the time we got, you know, a week into this thing and it was happening every single day, <laughs> we're like, all right, let's just roll with this. This is what this is the way it's going to go. Yeah. And I think there's something that is strengthening about that. I mean, you know, we we did something that was so challenging that the next time we go and do something, uh, you know, we'll be like, hey, we got this. We've seen this. We've before. seen this before. Yes. And, uh, I mean, that's all what they say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, it almost killed us. Well, th- we but must be super strong. We must be really strong Seriously. right now. So. Um, well, why don't, we start, why don't we start at the beginning? Man? Okay. So we, uh, we took a team of nine, mm-hmm. and we began the trip in Cairo. So we flew uh, from various points of the U.S. Um, many of us met up. Um, where did we meet up? Where was our in? So not Amsterdam. Most of you flew from Indianapolis. All of you met in um, I can't Germany. Remember. It Germany. Germany. It was in Germany. Yep. I think I want to say Frankfurt, but maybe yep. it was another city yep. in Germany. But yeah, you guys all met, and then you that last leg to Cairo, you all flew together. That's and right. Arrived at the same time. So we arrive in Cairo. You had already been there. Um, you had spent some time in Israel and in Egypt. So you met us there with our fixer, and um. And it was it was full steam ahead, really. Yeah. From the arrival, that first day was uh, prepping gear, right? And there's a f- fun recap yeah. video that you can go and watch. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and I'll back up for a second because um, I went to Israel and Egypt, like you mentioned, pr- prior to you all arriving. Part of it was just just taking a, a trip with my wife, um, but then you know I ended up spending some time working, and it was. It was very much worthwhile, yeah. and you know we've been to Israel before, and we I, I was literally in the country, flew from Israel to uh, yeah. Egypt, and I remember texting you and saying, "Dude, we need to talk because the culture <laughs> shock, yes, even just coming from Israel to Egypt was unbelievable. I knew coming from the United States to Egypt was going to be was going to be crazy, and yeah. I, I'm sure you felt that as soon as you got. I I know I did. I yeah. mean everything from the traffic and the driving to there was more of a language barrier to you couldn't get things as readily available in in Egypt. I mean, like I knew immediately stepping into the country, this is not going to be the same kind of production that we've done before. Yes, and that was really valuable. I remember you texted me two or three days before we were set to fly uh, when you arrived, and and you were just like. We've got to talk. Yeah. We've got to talk. This is not Israel. And then there was radio silence from you for about 30 minutes. And I was like, what does oh, that right. mean? What does that yeah. mean? Um, it was not anything we couldn't overcome. No. But I did very much appreciate the prep of like, look, don't get here and think, yeah, we've done this before. I know what this is going to be like. Man, I was not prepared for Egypt traffic. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that I keep telling yeah. people about. Like, let, let me just tell you, those first couple of days, I couldn't look out the window while we were driving. We weren't driving. <laughs> yeah. We were just riding. Correct. But yeah. if I focused too much out the window, I I would get freaked out. Yeah. Because it's like every moment. It's like everywhere you went. Then we're going right. to run into that one. Exactly. You know, there's a motorcycle squeezing between a space that should not be able yeah. to, you know, physically possible. Um, and the roads aren't the same as, you know, I mean, like driving no down a highway, signals, there's no, no, no signals, no lanes, people walking across what we would consider to be interstates, you know, yes, cars parked on interstates, picking up people. Just in I the mean, middle. Yeah, stop. You know, it, it's, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, that that's, and you know, I've heard that's, that's like, Egypt traffic is legendary. So we've seen some of the worst I think there is in the world, well, it, but it was... Well, it was bad, and yet at the same time, it was also impressive Oh yeah, that we spent that many days. And as far as I'm aware, nobody died. Nobody died. <laughs> you know, they, they have figured out 
how to operate yeah on those roads when rules are right the one who honks loudest gets the right of right. way i right. guess um so that was that was i think those first two or three days in the middle of cairo in the busyness and the hustle and bustle as our trip would progress we would get farther and farther out yeah rural mm -hmm. until we were wilderness yeah um so i think it was just as they say kind of baptism by fire those first couple of days man here we are we're a big team catching up with a big team because we had a, a local egyptian team led by muhammad and ali was uh, was the guy helping us with with gear and his team yeah Honestly, I lost track of how many people. I think sixteen or seventeen. Uh, I think total our our crew plus their crew. They had six. I think six uh, people, and then we had nine people. Uh, maybe that's not even. Yeah, maybe ten people. So I mean, yeah. it, well, I think you're right. Sixteen or so. You know, and before we went, you know, I think let's back up even further. Um, you know, Muhammad was telling us we need uh, to add people to the crew. And we were pushing back. We were saying, look, we've, we, this is not what we've typically operated with. We typically have our people and then we have a, a guide or a fixer and then yeah. a driver. But he was like, no, you, you don't understand. And we didn't. We I mean, didn't. I, I'll be honest, like when we got there and that first scene we shot in the marketplace, <laughs> I was like, our gear would have been gone. It would have been gone and we would have been like, what is was going on here? Um, and so having all of the people that we did, while it was a big crew to move around, they did help. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was just something that I don't think we were fully prepared for as well. But it did make lo logistics harder because we had to have multiple vans. And I mean, anywhere we went, we were not uh, small. We were very noticeable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, with the security... You know, anytime we pulled up to checkpoints or, the, I mean, there was people that had to hop out and talk to the police. Uh, I mean, there was, we had, we had military with us. We had, I guess, government minders. I'm not exactly sure. There was people with us that I'm not even sure what their role was, but they, they helped smooth <laughs> things. They had suits. Yes. And they had guns. That's right. And... Yeah, you know, smoothed some things out for us, and it made it very clear that if it had just been us and we were just kind of going in and doing our own thing, uh, we wouldn't have gotten very far. No, we would have gotten halfway through the first day and went, "That's that's all we're going to be allowed that's, to do." That's going to be it. <laughs> um, so yeah, man, Cairo. That was that was such a cool experience because even though it had some of the same vibes of say the old city of Jerusalem right. or some of the cities in Turkey that we visited. Um, it had its own flavor. Yeah, you know, it had its own, obviously, its own language. the The things that they were selling were different, very much Egyptian. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the food was different. Yeah, and that was fun. That was fun for us. Um, I, I think the way I've been describing it to people was uh, Israel. Um, while it's technically in the Middle East, it doesn't feel as Middle Eastern. Turkey, I don't even really feel like it feels Middle Eastern at all. It feels very European. Yes. Um, uh, we, this was the first time I actually felt like I am in the Middle East. Yes. And, and walking through the marketplace and, and driving down the road and seeing signs in Arabic and not English. And, and I mean, like this was the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it just was very different than, than Israel where, you know, the marketplace in Jerusalem, it's very multicultural. I yes. mean, you have the Jewish, you have the Christian, you have you have some Middle Eastern in there, but it's not just Middle East. Um, yes. And there's multiple languages spoken in Jerusalem and in Israel. Um, Egypt is, it's Arabic. Yes. And it's Arab. And uh, they're very, I think they're very proud of that. I think they, they're proud of, they're called, they, they're, we're Egyptians. And uh, they like the fact that they're Arab. Um, you go to Israel, you're Jewish. Or if you're Palestinian, you're probably Arab, um, or you're you're from another country completely, yes. and you're just in Jerusalem and Israel because you've kind of moved your life there, but you're still your descent is elsewhere. So it's yes, it's like a melting pot in Israel. It, it is, and I um, in Israel, you can't really go anywhere without hearing English being spoken Correct. somewhere. Yeah, 
you know, uh, nowadays, pretty much everyone who lives there likely speaks English as well. And g- good on them. We ought to do more of that. We should do more. Here. Yeah. Um, learning a second language, uh, it's taught in schools now. now. That's not so much the case there in Egypt. So even some of, um, some of our local crew uh, didn't necessarily speak English or we speak didn't. it well enough that, that we could converse. And so translators were, were more necessary this time around. Yeah. Um, but I got to give it to that, that crew, you know, and for, I probably need to apologize to them for the first couple of days where it's like, I'm frustrated that things aren't moving as fast <laughs> sure. because they can't understand the words I'm saying. And that's, yeah. the, that's just as much my fault because sure. I haven't taken the time to learn their language. Um, but you could tell from all of them, they were, they were willing to help. They were trying to help. Oh, they wanted to help. They were trying to get stuff done. Um, and there was this pesky thing called language that was <laughs> making it difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the thousands of people kind of moving and... It's a lot of people. You know, uh, crashing around us. And we're trying to get gear through or get the shots that we need. And Yeah. Um, yeah. I did notice a similarity, both in, in Israel, Turkey, now in Egypt, where... Um, here in the U.S., you can pull cameras out, and people will usually keep their distance. They'll give you a wide berth. They mm-hmm. don't. They won't, don't really want to interfere. Um, in the cities like Cairo or in Jerusalem, you pull cameras out, and that is an everyday occurrence. Like they're used to camera crews coming in, people yeah. shooting documentaries and whatever. They don't care. Right. They'll walk right through your shot, and yeah. it's not. Yeah. And so you've just got to learn to embrace that. Yeah. There's not going to be, a, okay, you need to block that street and block that street because we don't want anyone. No. You're shooting the scene, and there's going to be buses driving, and that was Cairo especially. It buses was. driving, giving us about six-inch clearance, you know, it, filling up the shot. And you know what? Roll. Um, now that you say that, I, I'd forgotten all about that. But <laughs> uh, I, I shot video, you may have as well, on, our, on my phone of us at dinner and these massive tour buses going through these very narrow streets in the marketplace. I'm blown away that they actually let them do that, but anything goes. You know, usually they would clear it without us having to move back, but sometimes it's like, no, man, he's he's here. Camera's got to move. Camera's got to move. He he gets right. the right away. He gets the yeah. And I'm, we're at dinner. We're sitting at dinner that first night in the marketplace, and our crew is having to shuffle their chairs toward the table. Yeah, because there's a tour bus <laughs> that is coming behind there. I mean, like yep. as if there was somebody trying to to shuffle past them to go to the restroom or something. Yep. It was a bus, but it's a bus. It's a bus. Yeah, a big bus. Yep. So anyway, that's yeah. I, I think we could go all over the place with this. Talk. You mentioned equipment. Um, yes. When we got there, we we had a, a, a chance to prep the equipment. Talk about that. Yes, and again, that was another issue with uh, language differences. Egypt was was very unique in that. For the first time, our team had to rely on renting equipment once we arrived in country. Whereas in the past, we have rented the majority of our our gear here in the U.S. and we'll travel and with travel it. with it to save headaches in customs. They recommended, and it was a good recommendation, that we take care of it once we arrive. But that meant that we needed to arrive and get our hands on those cameras for the first time the day before we start shooting. Yeah. And so normally, and you guys have seen time lapses of this from previous trips, you and me and Jet and others will get together and we'll have a whole day before prepping we leave. the gear before we, we leave. Pack it. And and we know how it's all gonna get assembled. We know we've got every little cable in piece and all of that. This time we had to do that the night before we started shooting. Right. right. And and for and for for those that listen to this podcast that are in the documentary filmmaking space, they're probably having heart palpitations. Well, <laughs> they are if they're going to go to Egypt, but the, <laughs> Egypt is not a carne country. Correct. You've probably heard us talk about carnes before. Most countries uh, they require you to have a carne, which lists all of the equipment you're bringing in for the documentary shoot. And if you have it all in there, Craig's dealt with these before. They stamp it here in the United States. And then it gets reviewed and stamped in the country that we visit. Israel is a carne country. Turkey is a carne country. And then your gear goes in and it comes out. And that, that's for, that may, they want to make sure you're not selling the equipment right. and uh, profiting off of it without paying taxes. Or yeah, they want to make sure that everything you brought in 
comes out. You bring it all out. Exactly. And you have to get very detailed. Uh, every cable, every battery, yeah. you know, every lens, all has to be listed. And and it smooths the process. It gets you through quickly. It does. Egypt is not Egypt a carnate doesn't country. doesn't have that. They don't do that. So what happens is, and I've heard crews that do this, they bring equipment into the country. They don't have any official paperwork, or maybe they do have something that's semi-official, but Egypt doesn't recognize it. And so then they get their gear confiscated, and they either have to pay a lot of money to get it back, or they just don't get it back. Just don't get it. And so that that was our fixer's recommendation prior to early on in this uh, whole production. We knew that they were saying, "Don't bring your own gear. Rent your gear locally in the country. It'll be easier." Yeah. It in some ways in it some ways was. it was, in some ways it was not. <laughs> you know, so um, in the United States, if you rent gear from a rental house. Uh, you typically get a package and you go to that rental house and it's all packaged in, in cases and it's got all the equipment, all the lights, or all the cables, all the monitors, whatever you need. It's all together. In this country, in Egypt, it was like we would go into a room and they would bring one piece of equipment in at a time and say, hey, does this look good? And we're like, well, this is a camera body. It looks fine, but we need a lens and we need a monitor <laughs> and a and battery, we, and a battery and a, and, you know. in order for yeah. And so then they would kind of rush around and get all that together so we could then test camera. You know, we did that with uh, our cameras. Yes. Uh, the audio equipment was um, it was not good. I'll just <laughs> say it was not up to our standards. Yeah. And so they had to go outside of their rental house and find equipment that we could use. So that was a little bit stressful. In the end, we got all of the equipment that we needed to make the project. Uh, it was just a very different experience. Yeah. And, and I think part of that has to do with the uh, the Arabic way of doing things is is different than the American way of doing things. Yes. And, you know, even the most seasoned professional has to double and triple check their gear. Maybe right. they arrive and they, oh, I left that one piece of gear we keep saying cables cables are the commonly forgotten they are. but essential pieces they're the achilles heel yeah if you don't have a cable between the camera and the monitor the monitor's useless if yeah. you don't have a battery to, to power the camera the right. camera is useless you need every little piece and even the most seasoned professional will forget those things well yeah. this time around there's no going back to my house and getting what i forgot exactly like we're in country and so it needs to all be here yeah and so those first couple of days we were we were dealing with those Achilles heels. We were yeah. kind of like, oh, we didn't yeah. realize we needed this. We didn't realize normally that would all just come together yeah. in your package. Um, yeah. And so it's it's working through those things. It's working to to get to know this group of people that are, were complete strangers the day before. Working out those kinks, I think, and this is what's funny about the trip. By the time we got it figured out, things are, are going smoothly we leave Egypt, yeah, and we go into Jordan, where we had to get new gear, new gear, new team, yeah. And so ev everything that we had figured out, even Muhammad, who who were originally was supposed to accompany us through the whole trip, even into Jordan, yeah, found out the day of he couldn't accompany he couldn't us with into us. Jordan. So right. it is brand new team, brand new gear, yeah. It's not Canon cameras anymore. Now it's Sony, Sony. cameras anymore, mm -hmm. which I thought was fantastic, but um, yeah. And then it's like okay, reset. Yeah, let's let's uh, figure this out as well. And so, and I and I think all of that, if we had not mentally prepared ourselves in advance for that, would have been devastating to us. Um, but because we knew that we were going to encounter challenges uh, going into Egypt, uh, I think we were kind of prepared for it. I felt like before we left, I was kind of like this negative, like crying wolf type person like you don't understand it's gonna be really really bad it's gonna be horrible How bad could it possibly know, be Stuart? you know and we we but based on past experience we're like come on Stuart, st stop it's gonna be fine <laughs> and, you know and it's, at some level you were not crying wolf. i was not crying wolf no um okay so we, we we were in cairo and then after cairo we went to luxor we should mention before you jump into luxor the thing that helped one of the things that helped smooth out even the most frustrating of circumstances was the food. I do food remember distinctly, we're trying to get all the gear, we're frustrated that 
they don't have what That's we thought right. that they were going to have. And the recommendation w- recommendation was made. Why don't you guys go and grab some dinner? That's right. We're going to keep prepping the gear here. By the time you guys eat, you come back. That was such a great idea. And the food was good. The food was super good. That was probably some of the best shawarma I've had. And that chicken. I mean, they just roasted just a whole chicken, you know. And then you wrap it in a pita and man. I tell you, the Middle East knows how to do food. Yes. The Middle East knows how to do food. It's it's true. Um, You know, and so for the sake of time, we'll we'll kind of rush through uh, Luxor. But we were there like, I mean, we we rushed through that country, that, that city. We were there like 24 hours, if that. We had a... The train ride, which there is a recap video on. Go watch it on our YouTube channel. Yes, it's, it's referred to as the nightmare train. It's, to it's its own story. Yes. It's its own story. Um, more and, to come. And more to come on that. <laughs> then we were there. We went, uh, we, we shot at the temple at Karnak and uh, at a brick factory, which both were really cool. Yes. And then we slept for like seven hours, if that, and then caught like a 5 a.m. flight to the Sinai Peninsula. Well, you forgot a very important detail of that that flight. We actually flew back oh, to right. Cairo. We flew back to Cairo. <laughs> so that we could fly from Cairo to the Sinai Peninsula. Yeah. Um, and we give you such grief about that. Like, you, you prepped us. We agreed. Most people will take a flight from Cairo to Correct. Luxor. And it's a 45-minute yeah, flight. It's, it's not a long that, flight. Super quick. Yeah. You recommended, and we agreed, <laughs> we agreed to take an overnight train. Yeah. I don't know what it was, 10, 12 hours. 10, 10, 10 it hours. It felt like it was three years. Yeah. But a train to, to Luxor. Um, I tell you what, it was way more interesting and will be more interesting in the final project than if we just... That's what I was. Th- Hopped it's, a all flight. it's all story. It's That's all story. It's all story. But you're right, though. That, that train was ride something was something else. I don't think we slept... I know that the way they had it situated, and you can tell your own stories about it, the way they had it situated with the beds, that. you know, the train is going down the tracks, and then occasionally it would pass another train, and what felt like inches from my feet. Yes. And so I'm like pulling my feet up in my bed, like as if the train is going to hit my feet as it's passing. <laughs> yeah. But it was loud. It was... Yeah. Yep. I, it, I don't know how to... And I I mean, you and I are about the same height. You're a little taller than I am, but poor Ryan... I know. Could, ...couldn't actually fit no. on one of those beds. No. And no. so he's, you know, he's crammed up in there. Look, it was so bad that even our local, our Egyptian, Muhammad and Ali, who rode the train with us, were like, you know they have There's flights. <laughs> Why are we doing this? It's like a final <laughs> warning here. Final right. warning. There's still time. This is your last chance. Um, but... Uh, yeah, man. Uh, and I tried to grab a couple of photos because I'm in there before I try to get some semblance of sleep with my laptop trying to dump footage I, from the yeah, day, yeah. you know, and there's this tiny little plastic uh, tray in the wall <laughs> where I could set the heavy laptop with the hard drives that are hanging off. But oh, the man. train, it's not a smooth ride. No, not at all. You know, so I'm sitting there and the yeah. laptop is yeah. shaking itself out of the wall and I'm afraid like the hard drives are, and I'm just kind of holding it down. Jeremy and I were, were sharing, a, yes. sharing a room and uh, it's just like, Jeremy, <laughs> well, I'm going to need you to put your foot here to balance this so that because if the you know the hard, hard drives, drives pop out mid transfer, we're going to lose the footage from the day. Yeah. It's like this is this is what we agreed to. That's right. This is what we agreed to. So anyone who says that uh, these trips are glamorous just like all expense paid cruises I've got needs some to ride the, yeah, to <laughs> share with we've you. got some photos. They need to ride the train from Cairo to Luxor. Yeah. So. But a great experience and yeah. Luxor man, you could do a whole episode on that. Uh, I think you know Jet had been there before. Jet is a huge fan of Egypt history and yeah. culture and Man, uh, the Temple of Karnak was something that you could spend days there, yeah. and we just had a few hours. Interviewed a, a fantastic gentleman there, yeah. uh, an Egyptologist. Um, We've got some content so, with him. So much good stuff. Yeah. yeah, Justin, Jeremy talked to him uh, for Out of Egypt, and then Justin pulled him aside for a uh, first, I'll call it a podcast episode. We don't really know what it is going to be yet, but it was a deeper conversation on... Uh, just Egyptian culture and Egyptian hieroglyphs. He's he he actually can read yeah. hieroglyph hieroglyphs, and um, it was just a fascinating conversation. But the temple, you know, and to kind of give people a little bit of background in it, the temple at Karnak 
it, that was the place of power during the time of Moses and the Exodus. You know, no matter w- whether you believe in the early dating or the late dating, it would have been in Luxor in that place, mm-hmm. um, Upper Egypt. And, and so there's a lot of history there that directly points to, hey, this is, this is what uh, the worship of Egyptian gods looked like at the time of the Exodus. So the Israelites were surrounded by this kind of, yes. you know. And so I think that was a really cool spot to go to specifically because we can, we can look at it and go, hey, this is kind of what the, what the Israelites were feeling when they were in, yeah, in Egypt. Yeah, just inundated with it, just yeah. surrounded by yeah. an impressive, oh, very, very impressive. impressive stuff. And so for them to, you know, without delving too much into it, but for them to then be taken out into the wilderness where yeah, they, they don't have temples, you know, they don't have these amazing statues and structures and stuff, but they're worshiping the God that devastated those other gods. Right. I mean, yeah. it's just some really fascinating uh, comparisons yeah. and, and contrasts. Yeah. Um, so then we hop over into the... Sinai. Sinai Peninsula, and things start changing. They do. You know, for the production. It's no longer busy and packed mm-hmm. full of people. We are we are out in the desert. Yeah. Uh, in the wilderness. Uh, mm-hmm. So don't think empty sand dunes. Yeah. Not yet. That's on the other side of Egypt. That's on the other side. Um, but mountainous, you just, you can see for miles, and it's dusty, and it's hot. It is. And yeah. And um, you know, we and we talked about this before we we left that this was going to be quite a visual to show the wilderness, and you can imagine what you just mentioned coming from Cairo. I mean, they weren't in Cairo at that point, but in 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 modern Egypt for them, mm-hmm. uh, civilized Egypt to the middle of nowhere, and they're like, "What are we doing here?" Yeah, uh, that's where Mount Sinai possibly was. I, I tell you what, to go <laughs> off on a little bit common of, question. Yeah, to go off on a little bit of a rabbit trail here. We we did visit um, the Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula, which is one of the spots that possibly could have been the Mount Sinai. But we are no longer we are not planting a flag and saying that this is the spot. We just kind of used it as the backdrop to tell this part of the story. Right. I think it's important to say because we have had a lot of people who have uh, said, oh, it's not this one, it's actually this one. There's, there's a lot of beliefs out there. There's a lot of traditions out there about which one it is. And um, I hope people realize that we don't know. Yes. We have ideas, and there are different theories, but we don't know. And yeah. any archaeologist who's going to tell you this is the spot, what evidence do they have? Right. Yeah, and that's to be fair, because... Um there are people who are actually producing documentaries right now that are doing a very thorough job in yeah. presenting the evidence behind, I thought there were kind of three major mm-hmm. uh, locations. There, There's up to six. Oh, wow. I didn't Did know you that. know there's I up to six different locations? And each have, some of them, I'd say, compelling reasons why that could be. Okay. Our answer to it from the beginning has been that that's not what this documentary is about. Right. Because I don't want, and, and we don't want, to spend the entirety of it, it could be this and here's why, it could be this and the, here's why. Because do you know what's going to happen at the end of the, we're going to say, but we don't know for sure. Yeah. So thanks for wasting, you know. That's right. Thanks for wasting your time. Yeah. Um, instead, we want to take you to a location, a place that has for for many hundreds of years been considered the location. Um, and there are some some compelling reasons why it could be. There are some compelling reasons why others could be. But we're going to go up there and we're going to talk about what really matters is what happened yeah. at the top of the mountain. Right. Um, what did God say? What did Moses do? What did the people do? Mm-hmm. And... Uh, because that's it's a pivotal moment. That's right. Um, that's worth talking about. Yeah, yeah. And so, kind of as, as you alluded to, we we were able to climb Mount Sinai, <laughs> and that was an experience. I'm continuing to point people to other pieces of content because right. we're kind of creating this whole tapestry of of content that uh, that shows people what the experience was like and what the and so the podcast that uh, was just released uh, a few weeks ago with Dan Kingsley and Nolan Hoofner was actually filmed on top of Mount Sinai yeah after climbing it and uh, they have some great insight into uh, what that experience was like and Dan talks a little bit about 
how there are very few spots in the world that all three major world religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, kind of look at and say, this is a pivotal moment in our story. Mm. And Mount Sinai is one of those spots yeah. because of the fact that um, all three of those religions believe in Moses. Uh, the Ten Commandments are absolutely pivotal to the um, the uh, Jewish religion. And of course, you know, we look at the Ten Commandments, we look at that whole thing, it's, it's, it's a huge part of the Old Testament for Christianity. And so um, that's kind of cool, I think, because yeah. there aren't a lot of places like that. Right. Yeah, so the three, you said three major religions, uh, three major monotheistic religions. So Correct. these three groups that believe in one God um, all hold the site of Mount Sinai, whichever mountain it may be, but the yeah. site of Mount Sinai to be of utmost importance yes. um, to to the narrative of, of the story. And so, yeah, we were up there, but we were by no means the only religious group being right. represented up there. Right. And that was actually quite fascinating. It was. You know, we're, I remember we're shooting a scene with Jeremy. We had, we had climbed up, the sun is setting, which was just, f- for me personally, it was, it was an absolute Appian Media highlight. It was really cool. Um, just to be up there and, and see that. But people are walking by Jeremy, and he even engages in conversation with, with some yeah. um, of a variety of beliefs, which I found um, very encouraging. And then we got to spend the night up there in the open air. Yeah. In the freezing cold. It was cold. Um, but there there are Bedouins that live up there for a few months at a time. There are stone structures, um, houses, but but open, kind of open stone structures. There's snacks and water and things that they yeah. sell up there. There is. Um, but then they they fed us dinner. Yeah. And dude, that was it, that was something else. I, yeah, I think um, as many um, roadblocks or speed bumps that we encountered throughout that production, that for me personally was kind of one of the moments that I, I will never forget. Because you're right, we're on top of one of the traditional sites of Mount Sinai. We are having dinner uh, being cooked over an open fire by a, a couple of Bedouin men um, who, who live up there part of the year and, and do this for tourists. And it was amazing food. But beyond that, I looked around at one point after the cameras had stopped rolling. And we're sitting around, and it's our crew with the uh, Egyptian crew uh, with a couple of women who were up there from... Um, I think from Israel and from, I mean, I, right. they were from, they were not from Egypt and they were not from the United States. And so, and then of course our Bedouin and we're all talking and we're all having a conversation and we're all enjoying each other's company and laughing and telling jokes. And I don't know, there's just something about that for me that's special because it shows that we are all, we're all human beings. Just people. We're just people. Yeah. And we all have a lot more in common than a lot of times the world may uh, portray, right? And, and to me, those are special moments. Yeah. And there's and there's a, there's a few moments like that throughout Appian's history that I've been able to be like, this is a watershed moment for me personally. Um, in Hebron, when we played soccer and had tea with that with that um, Palestinian yeah. family in the West Bank, that was one of those moments. But this that was one of the moments for me. Yeah. And so, you know, it kind of made all of the struggles that we had had previously, kind of melt away yeah so yeah and and physical and mental struggles that was um that was for me personally the the most strenuous hike i've ever been on okay oh wow um and i'm proud to say yeah even though we had multiple offers all the way up to hop on a camel or hop on a donkey if we're getting too tired, you know, and these guys are relentless. They, they are, are. They're pretty much walking right next to you. They are. With camel over here like, hey, hey. You, you want know, a camel? For, you know, for five, not five dollars. You know, it was the equivalent of probably like two U.S. dollars. It was yeah. going to be so cheap. And they're like, you don't have to walk anymore. You got camel yeah. over here. And it's like, I'm not going to be the first to break. Like, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be the Nobody first. Nobody wanted to do it. So we all just grit our teeth and, and Ryan... Um, and there's even video of it. I won't embarrass him by putting it up there, but I think we all kind of had moments and Ryan had moments where it's like, we're, we're questioning most, most of our life decisions. Oh yeah. Halfway up that mountain where it's like, it's hot. where is that camel? We're tired. <laughs> um, but 
then you get to the top and you go like, look, look what we've done together. Mm -hmm. And everyone stayed safe. Um, except when Justin tried to go down and, and save that juice box. Um, and there's a video of, there's that, a video as well. of that as well. Um, we should, I think we should in this episode, in the show notes, we need to link to all these different uh, absolute videos. So that way people can follow the trail if they want to. And there's more of those coming out. So even yeah. though, you know, we have been obviously back from this trip for now for multiple weeks, we are trying to continue to share quick little behind the scenes. Uh, there's so much more that we can share. And so um, if you haven't already subscribe to the YouTube channel, to our Facebook page because there are more of these fun behind the scenes that are that are coming out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, check out the. <laughs> I think it's called "Are You Gonna Die for a Juice Box?" Um, he's check hey, that he's out for just sure. fearless, Justin. Yeah. yeah, and and we haven't talked enough about him, but he was on that trip for the first time. Um, we should certainly interview him at, at some point yeah. and, and get, get his, his take on perspective it. on this. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like that was to me. You know, we had gone through such difficulty. And then we get to this moment, and I felt like, okay, if we can do what we just did, we we can do the rest of this. You know, let's 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 take a moment and take a breath, literally, at the top of this mountain. Let's let's wake up refreshed and ready to get the rest of this done. Because there would certainly be more challenges right. into Jordan, but that wrapped up about our time in Egypt. It did. So when we made this story, we knew that it was going to be following the journey of the Israelites out of Egypt, but it also was going to follow Jeremy's journey. It was going to follow our team's journey. And it's it's not a stretch to say that the pinnacle of the Israelites' journey out of Egypt is when they this covenant was established with God and these commandments were were brought down off of Mount Sinai. By Moses, like that is that is a watershed moment yes. in uh, Israelite history and Jewish history, and so that was the pinnacle of that journey, and it very much it was the pinnacle of our journey. I think we all kind of point at that and go, okay, that was the moment where we knew that it was a struggle getting there, and that things weren't over yet, and it was going to be there was going to be more struggles to come. But this moment was was powerful. Yeah. And so I think it's it's amazing how it just parallels so well uh, with what the Bible talks about when it talks about their their journey. Yeah. So, and I can look at you know we are still so early in the post production. We're going to talk more about that in an upcoming episode. But I've already been able to glance, and you have at what we were able to capture at yeah. the top of that mountain. Oh man, not gorgeous. just a podcast episode, man. That's just the the you know tip of the. That's iceberg. just the teaser there, yeah. Um, but what we were able to capture with those Bedouins as yeah. they prepared a meal for us, what mm -hmm. what uh, what Jeremy and Justin were able to talk about when they were up there um, sharing the team's experience and thinking about the Israelite. And it just, if I can say, it just looks gorgeous. It does. It looks really, really good. Very authentic. Yeah. There was no um, staging of that. Right. It really was just, I think what our team does best is this thing's happening now. This thing's happening now. Where do we, where do we set everybody up to make this thing just happen organically and authentically and, uh, and look really nice and boy, it, it does. Yeah, I, I think so too. So, um, and then we uh, we leave the Sinai Peninsula and we we take a ferry ride across uh, a, a finger of the Red Sea called the Gulf of Aqaba over to Aqaba, Jordan. Uh, and I think let's leave it there and then have a break. And then yep. when we can come back from the break, we can talk about the Jordan leg. Oh, that was something else. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. We have returned from our production trip to Egypt and Jordan for our next major project out of Egypt, looking at the biblical lands of the Exodus. Our crew traveled to ancient Egyptian sites, took a 4x4 through the Sinai Peninsula, and camped in the deserts of the Jordanian wilderness on this incredible journey. While principal production is complete, post-production is just getting started, and there are still opportunities for you to be involved. Right now, if you go to fundraiser.appianmedia.org, you can help support the post-production and distribution with a donation of any amount. Your donation will ensure that we can make this series the best that it can possibly be, and ensure that we can release this as soon as possible. Appian Media is a 501c3. All donations are tax deductible. So please consider donating today to make Out of Egypt a reality. And thanks. 
So that ferry ride across the Red Sea, we did not even attempt to try and cross the Red Sea the same way that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. Right. Uh, Moses was nowhere to be found. You know, the staff and uh, it did not right. split. Uh, this ferry was something else. I've never done that. Have you? Like, this uh, was not a boat ride. No, this was a ferry ride. This was a, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a vehicle. It's a vessel large enough that they were carrying cars Correct. on yeah. this, right? I've done that a few times. Um, but yeah, it's... That was interesting. And I mean, and we're talking not just cars, we're talking trucks. There was military equipment on this ferry. Yes. Um, hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. And yeah, so and it wasn't like a short 30-minute boat ride. This was hours. I mean, once we finally got off, out of port yeah. in Egypt, it was a three-plus-hour ride uh, across the Gulf of Aqaba to Jordan. And what was neat about that experience was it's a very narrow uh, strip of water, and you could see, uh, we could see into Saudi Arabia. Uh, and at one point, as we came into port, uh, you could see Egypt, Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. Yeah. That's, it's like that's, that was a point where they all kind of had uh, little inlets going in. Because, I mean, that is a major uh, waterway and thoroughfare. Right. Uh, the Red Sea in itself, I mean, on the other, the other finger of it, for your little geography, is, is where the Suez Canal is, which is a, that's the waterway that gets uh, a lot of European uh, traffic from the Mediterranean Sea down into like the southern, like the Indian Ocean, Southern Pacific, all of that, without having to go all the way around Africa. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyway, so there's incredibly your important. Exactly. Incredibly important. Yeah. So we hop on this ferry, and we're we're leaving one country. Yeah. And when we arrive, when we dock, we are then entering Jordan. So then we've got to do customs. Yep. Um, prior to getting on the ferry, we need to say goodbye to our Egyptian crew. Mm -hmm. We need to say goodbye to Muhammad and Ali and their their team. Um, we need to return the gear. Yeah. And so for the Canon lovers on our team, you know, Canon cameras, we're shooting with, we didn't mention this, uh, we were shooting with the C70s, which are cinema cameras from Canon. Uh, we were shooting with R6s, R6s mm -hmm. uh, which are mirrorless. They are. Correct? Yeah. Mirrorless cameras that are small enough that you could put on a gimbal. Yeah. They were the ones that we could use kind of more handheld, but both of those cameras are putting out stellar images. I mean, really nice stuff. I used to shoot on Canon. It was familiar enough that Jet, who is a Canon user, and I could get it done. Yeah. But now we're switching. Yeah. We arrive in Jordan. They don't have the same Canon cameras right. that we wanted. We were at the mercy of what uh, what the rental house in Amman had available. And they told us before we even yes. arrived, Look, we don't have the C70s. Um, I don't know if it's well, you know, and, and we kind of behind the scenes, we were hearing from some of the local crew in Jordan that there's just a lot of customs and paperwork, and it just gets to be so expensive to get some of this camera gear into the country that people just don't, yeah, they don't buy it. So, so we then went with Sony cameras, and again for the gearheads uh, listening to our podcast, we got the Sony FX9s, and these are uh, certainly bigger. Yeah. Than any of the cameras we've used before. The cinema cameras, really nice picture, but these are not things that you would just hold with your hands. Correct. They need to sit on a tripod or they need to be mounted on your shoulder. And I don't know about you, like I haven't done that since working <laughs> at the news station yeah. a decade ago where every camera had to be mounted, right. mounted on your shoulder. Um, so that was kind of a, it felt like a throwback, but it wasn't because these things are putting out a quality of picture that, it was it was beautiful. Uh, it was really really nice. You know, and, and uh, thankfully, and you know, you mentioned Jet is a Canon guy, but Ryan is a correct. Sony guy. Correct. And that was extremely helpful because when we got in there, I mean, if it had just been Jet, you and me, uh, I think we probably would have been like, what? We don't. We wouldn't even know our way around the menus very well. And and but Ryan was able to go. You need, you need this setting, yeah. and you want your camera to be doing this and this, and this is the firmware you want updated. Yeah. So that was very helpful. Because not all cameras are created equal. They are not. You'd say, well, I just want a 4K camera. Well, <laughs> by now they're all pretty much shooting 4K. But yeah. what what kind of images do you want? What kind of dynamic range do you want to have? Right. What kind of format are you shooting in? What kind of cards are you using? You know, and so those it, are all things that we didn't leave to guesswork. We spent months 
yeah, working with Muhammad and working with, and we had uh, meetings internally just right. as to what all those settings would be, yeah. and, and that's a good point because like none of this is left up to when we get there. We're like, uh, let's just shoot on this, and we're you know, no. there is discussions because it, it, it a lot of that involves not only the picture that you want and the look that you want, but then also the uh, the file size and the storage and. Yes. There's all kinds of uh, repercussions downstream that if you don't think about that stuff in advance can really yeah. come back to Because you'd you. think the temptation is, well, hey, if it can shoot 8K, obviously I'm going to shoot 8K. And if it can shoot, you know, 400 megabits a second, you know, obviously I'm going to shoot the highest, best. Well, then you've got to think about how quickly is that going to fill up a memory card? Yeah. Do we want to be dumping footage every 30 minutes while you're out shooting in the field? The answer is no. How many hard drives are you then going to bring um, and so it's finding this balance. We didn't shoot at the highest res that we possibly could, the highest bit rate that we possibly could. I will say it is going to be the best image Appian Media has ever put out by far. Right. But those are just all of the things that we had to kind of talk through. And so getting our hands on these Sonys, uh, not only uh, shooting with those, but we were shooting with the, the FX3s, FX3s yeah. which are cinema cameras, mm -hmm. but they're small enough, again, that you could put on a, a gimbal, which we did, um, that you could handhold in certain situations, which I found us doing more frequently in yeah. Jordan. Yeah. There were some really run and gun kind of scenarios where even the FX9s were just too much there's this reset that happens. New team, uh, a woman named Lama, who mm -hmm. uh, was, was so helpful. But man, she was thrown right into it very first day. It didn't help that we our, our ferry ran late. And so yeah. we were really late getting into port. And then, of course, we had to process through customs. And so, I mean, by the time we were on the road, it was late already. And then we were, yeah. we were driving straight to Wadi Rum for our next day filming. And so we rolled into Wadi Rum late we hadn't seen the gear at that point. And so right. we're talking about an early morning with the gear. Our local crew had spent the day before and the night before prepping the gear. I mean, like... And they hadn't gotten much sleep right, at all. Right, things were starting to compound and it led to a very rough first day in Wadi Rum. I mean, we did get some stuff filmed and it was gorgeous. I tell you, that that area yes. of Jordan is unbelievable. Um, is a reason why Star Wars yep. and Dune and a lot of these major motion pictures use Wadi Rum to film because yeah. it is just absolutely gorgeous. But it was a rough first day. Yeah. Yeah, and and again, we kind of, throughout the production, we, we had to be reminded, and I, I don't know that any of us could say we were flawless in this, but we had to be reminded, we are not just concerned with producing something that God will be glorified in. Yeah but we're also concerned with producing it in a way that God would be glorified in. Yeah. And I think all of our patients were put to the test at various stages throughout this production, and we had to be reminded, and I'll give it to, to Justin. He wasn't certainly the only one, but um, he and I had a conversation there in Jordan where he's like, look, we may be these people's only experience with Christ. Yeah. And if they come away with this experience thinking those people have no patience and they're just, you know, running over the top of us and they're snapping at us and, and they're going to think, oh, that's what Christians are. That is, that's not the impression right. that we want to give. We need to show grace and we need to demonstrate patience even when everything around us seems to be, you know, pulling apart at the seams. Yeah. And there were moments like that. And there that, were moments like that. Where yeah. it's like, okay. That is important to remember, not just when you're shooting a documentary in a foreign country, but when I'm interacting with my coworker, yeah. you know, when the project that I'm working on is not going according to plan, when my kids maybe are not, yeah. you know, uh, behaving in the way that I wish they would, am I, am I showing Christ to them in my patience and in my long suffering? And it was a good reminder. It was a very good reminder. It was a good reminder. And, you know, um, and you know, I think we have we've been faithful uh, throughout our our years to make really good relationships and build really good relationships with our local fixers and guides. And um, you know, I know I could go back to any of the people locally that we've used in the past and and just say, "Hey, how are you? How are you doing?" And and be able to strike up a conversation. And I do feel like we that was the way it was with Muhammad 
and llama by the end. But it took some. It, it took, took some time. time. It took yeah. some finessing. It took some. Uh, relationship building, and I think it took some apologies. It took apologies. I, I, I had to give some apologies. You know, and that's just. And I think I can remember specifically that at the end of that first day in Wadi Rum, and let's just be let's full disclosure. <laughs> uh, uh, we got up late, or our, our local crew got up late. We didn't get the gear. gear uh, prepped in time. We were chasing the sunrise. Yeah. Uh, you know, things just were not going according to plan all through that day. And then at the end of the day, we ran a drone. I say we, uh, <laughs> the drone pilot, he was Ooh, really good, really good, <laughs> really, really good, ran the drone into a, a, a the side of a mountain. And we were in the dark, in the dark, searching for a memory card. That was, I think that was probably the lowest moment on the, on the production. And where we sat, we sat down at dinner and we're like, guys, what are we doing here? Yeah. What are we doing here? And it, it was that hard reset. And like, we have got to build a relationship and build a rapport with yeah. this crew if we are going to do and create and work together in the way we want to work together. That is, like you just said, Christ glorifying. Right. And so we had to stop and we had to say, what we're doing is not working. Maybe what they're doing is not working either, but it's not all on them. It's right. on us too. Right. And make that real conscious decision to... Uh, reset. And I think that was our reset moment. I really do think so, because I can point to that day and go, man, this is not working. This next thing is not working. That Throughout the day, though, we're still able to get the scenes that we needed. Yeah. You know, they're trying to track down the owner of a camel in the middle of the desert so that we can interview him before the sun goes down. That sounds simple, right? Well, no, it involves right. hopping into three vehicles that are equipped to drive through sand dunes yeah. without stalling to find the guy, to bring him to us. By the time we got to him, the sun had gone down. That doesn't mean the scene is lost. We're still shooting it. We've still got light. He doesn't speak English at all. So then there's a slower scene because you're interviewing him. Uh, I, I can't remember, Stu, if you were... if. You were with us in the truck where we're dr driving around after that scene. It seems like kind of trying to corral the team back yeah. up. We end up bumping into the drone pilot and his spotter. Yeah. And they're searching for something in the desert. Come to find out it's the drone. That's right. Oh, no, it's the drone. Well, not only was it the drone, but the drone had crashed and upon impact, it had jettisoned its battery and its memory card. I don't fly drones a ton, but I've done them enough. I've never heard of that happening, of a memory card coming out. That's yeah. And so I remember we're out there. Everyone's got their lights. We're spreading around in the desert. Like, if you guys could just, I'll pull up images to show you guys. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, This is an impossible task. It was. And I thought at first, memory cards come in various sizes. I thought at first it was about the size of a candy bar. And then we kind of play telephone with English and Arabic and go, no, 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 no. It's an SD card. It's the size oh, of this like... Is, this is getting ridiculous. Like your no, eventually, yeah. eventually, it's a micro SD card. And yeah. you're right. That is about the size of your fingernail. They will find that in 2,000 years and have footage that they can use. That It is such a small piece of tech that if the wind catches it right, it's gone. It's gone, yeah. Yeah. And so it kind of seemed like when word finally got out to enough of us as far as what we were actually looking for in the dark, in the sand, we were just like, wrap it up. We're done. Yeah. We're done. Yeah. And thankfully, listen, that drone pilot was something else. I've never seen flying like that. Yeah. The stuff that he was able to capture earlier in that day, thankfully, he had loaded to a computer. Right. He lost a flight. Um, with the sunset. With the sunset. And, you know, it, it was not the end of the world. It wasn't. And yeah. he felt bad, but that guy was on it. I mean, they got a new drone. They got everything. We didn't miss a beat. No. Yeah, um, you're right. And I'm thankful for him. But we did kind of have this, what are we doing? But then we had to ask ourselves, okay, how are we going to do this? You know, yeah. how are we going to go about this? Yeah. Are we going to build up this frustration and wake up tomorrow morning with that still in us? Right. Or are we going to offer them grace, offer ourselves grace, and tr and try this thing again in the morning? Yeah, and, and we, we did, and we did, and, and and I tell you, it really things looked up from there. Yeah, and, and by the end of it, um, I, I know when Lama left us, at the, dropped us off at the airport. It wasn't like we were leaving 
a uh, client or a a business associate, it was like we were leaving a friend. Yes. And I think that's that's the essence of what we try and do when we're there is is build those lasting relationships because like you mentioned, uh, we aren't just creating Christ-centered, Christ-focused content. We're trying to actually emulate Christ when we're there. Right. And uh, so, yeah, but uh, it was definitely an experience. Um, and so, you know, moving on from Wadi Rum, we left and we actually drove north uh, to Petra. Yes. And that was that was a surprise because we didn't expect it. Petra was not... It is not part of the Exodus. Correct. But we were just there. We were so close. We were like, we have to try and grab some content at Petra for future use, whether in a documentary, whether a standalone. We've done that in the past. Magdala in Israel mm-hmm. was a spot that we uh, we were blessed to be able to go and visit, and we created this whole standalone piece uh, on Magdala. We have no... Uh, biblical evidence that Jesus was ever in Magdala, but we know that Mary Magdalene was from Magdala, and there's a beautiful first century uh, synagogue in Magdala. Well, Petra is one of those places where we don't have any biblical evidence of somebody being in Petra, but there are a few, there's a few subtle clues that kind of reference Petra and the surrounding region. Yes. And uh, we were able to go and uh, Justin grabbed some content there uh, that, you know, who knows where it'll end up. But right. we also use that location as more wilderness backdrop. Yes. It honestly, it was a saving grace because as much as we were trying to get done, we were kind of steadily, we couldn't find the place for this scene. Okay, yeah. we're going to have to get that later. And we ran out of time for this scene. Okay, we're going to have to get that later. And Petra ended up being the saving grace where those scenes that had been pushed we were able to make use of this location um, to get some of those generic, we, yeah. we just need a place that looks like wilderness. Yeah. We just need a place where Jeremy can get tucked away here and discuss the covenant or something. And uh, we had a day and a half at Petra. Yeah. And it was the only location we actually had time to scout. Yes, the day before. The day before. Which was necessary. So necessary. And then the day of we were able to just bam, 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 get, yeah. I think we shot five s- different scenes, yeah. maybe even six in one day. I'd believe it. Um, which was not, it was unparalleled through the rest of the trip. Mm-hmm. And so that one, that one shoot day in Petra actually got us back on track, which I think also helped yeah. rejuvenate the team. Like, yeah. okay, maybe we can pull this thing off. Yeah. Yeah, so. but it was good, it, and we, we got some great content there. And then we continued to move north to uh, what would be our final location at Mount Nebo. Um, you know, and it's it's an interesting thing. We 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 landed, or we 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 stayed in Amman for a couple nights at I think probably the nicest hotel that we had had yes. that entire trip. And you know, again, we don't go to the five star, best of the best hotels, but man, we were in some. Uh, <laughs> Interesting. We have else. photos to share. We have photos to share. Oh. But anyway, it was nice at the end <laughs> to have a spot where we could just stop and rest. Yeah. And um, you know, I think Jeremy made the comment because we he and I were rooming together. He goes, I'm so glad that we're here at the end as opposed to the beginning, diving into what we're like, we're like, what what, what have we done? But um, but anyway, so we were in Amman and then we would go over to Mount Nebo and Mount Nebo turned into an amazing scene. So uh, beautiful. I didn't have the highest hopes for that scene because I knew what it was. It was a church on top of a mountain looking off into a, uh, cloudy abyss. And like, I was like, okay, this is just going to be ho-hum. But it, Ryan and Jet and, and company just managed to make it look amazing. Mm. I mean, mm-hmm. Just absolutely epic, and you know you can look out, you can see the Dead Sea. If you look really, really far, you can see Jericho, and so you know you're looking at the Jordan River and the Jordan Rift Valley, um, and it just was a great spot to close the documentary, close the trip because right. that was the the next day. I think the next That's day right. we we're we're going to get on right. planes to leave. So, and this would have been the very first time of any of the trips that we've taken that our last shot of the trip is actually the last shot of yeah. the project. Yeah. So it really did kind of feel for all of us, like 
that's a wrap, guys. Like, well right. done. We made it here because this is where the story, as far as we're, we're able to tell in this particular series, this is where the story ends. Um, this is where our story ends. And uh, that feeling of relief, that feeling of accomplishment, of camaraderie, you yeah. know, because then we did. We got a, a team photo um, of the Jordanian team there with us. And uh, just, uh, it was a great, great way to wrap it all up. Yeah, I think so. So, and then the next day, as we started full circle, because we talked about the flight from Amman to Chicago, that was it. And uh, we all kind of went our separate ways at that point. So, uh, you know, kind of looking back on it, we didn't lose any scenes. As as as, right. as rocky as it may have been at times, we shot, we went and we shot everything that we had hoped to shoot with out of Egypt. That's correct. Lessons from the land was different. Um, we got in there and quickly realized that we aren't going to be able to get everything. And so we got, you, you were directing that. We got four or five episodes. I believe that we shot five episodes. And the reason for that was we didn't want to just show up and go, we got to get it in the can. We got to shoot it. Yeah. You know, we wanted to make sure that while we're here, we're going to make it look good. We're going to make it sound good. And Barry is not feeling rushed. And so we realized very early on, we only had Barry for six days, that uh, we were going to shoot the scenes that needed to be in Egypt. Yes. There's no way to fake those surroundings. And we're going to make them look and sound good. Yeah. And the rest we will shoot later. Yeah. Um, you know, probably within the next few months. And I'll say, I'll say, you know, as the sound guy, I don't get behind the camera very often, but when I did peek at the monitor on those they looked amazing. Yes. Like there is no mistaking that Barry is in Egypt yeah. for those. There's and no I, green screen here. Guys. There's no green screen, but it's, yes. it's exciting to see it. Like in some of those spots that he was. Yes, it just looks beautiful. And I'll give I'll give credence to to Jet there. You know, poor Jet. We're pulling him off of those moments where, like, out of Egypt is still shooting, but I've got to duck away to be the the yeah. director over here and and coordinate with with Barry. Usually, I pulled in Nolan. Um, sometimes we're pulling in you as the sound guy. Right. But there were a couple of times where I had to kind of set up the shot. This is what I wanted to look like. And Jet, thankfully, gave me some time mm -hmm. and gave me his ability to say, okay, we can take this thing to the next level and was able to light it or control the light. Oh, good. Um, in a way that just yeah. and, really, and, uh, really took it up a notch. Yeah. And I think we got into a, a little bit of a rhythm where it was like, okay, when we show up, we're going to focus on this episode of uh, Lessons from the Land while Out of Egypt gets set up over here. Um, but in hindsight, you know, we're always learning. Uh, I think we probably needed two completely separate crews right. in order to do it justice. And Barry and his crew would go over here and film, you know, Ryan and his crew or whoever, Jeremy, and uh, would go over here and film their, their, and maybe they're at the same location, just in different places yeah maybe they're not but uh that would be because it was it, it was it was just a matter of we were stretching resources that were already probably thin even thinner and so something had to give and you know lessons from the land did and it's because of the fact that you, you got what you needed in egypt yeah but we can come and we've we've done that with the past couple of ones we can find places domestically that have a, a good background and, yeah. and film uh, the stand-ups. You know, we're still going to use a ton of footage from uh, the filming of Out of Egypt. Oh, absolutely. In Lessons from the Land. Yes. And we were able to get some great content of, I remember there in the Temple of Luxor, you know, Barry in the space and exploring and looking around and, you know, all of the the visuals that are going to be necessary to tell those stories, we captured. Yeah. Um, so really, we're just talking about filming, you know, six, seven, eight more of the of Barry speaking to camera, communicating the message, um, which we have in, in times past done domestically. So it was an easy decision to make after the first couple of days where we're like, look, we're not just going to do it. We're going to do it well. And if doing it well means we're going to take our time and get as many of these as, as we can and be content with what we've got, um, we're still on on track and on task to to get this thing done when we yeah. want to get it done. Absolutely. So, well, 
What a trip. Well, that was, yeah, man. man, I tell you what, this is a really good podcast episode. And, and if you've listened to this point in the episode, you know everything there is to know about production <laughs> of Out of Egypt and Lessons from the Land of the Exodus. Um, I, I'm going to say one thing. Um, let's link to, in the show notes, uh, let's make this a really good show notes. Let's link to some of those daily recap videos that you, that we mentioned. I also would like to share our schedules that our fixer put together. Oh, yeah. I think that'd be interesting for those, especially in the production space, who would like to see how do we develop these schedules. Uh, we'll share those documents. And then let's share the show Bible that we kind of have used as well. Oh, so, right. Um, let's get links to all those in the show notes so yes. that way somebody can listen to this episode and, and dive deeper into uh, some of these other documents and know, okay, this is hey, if I'm going to create a documentary in Egypt, this is maybe a, a blueprint to use. Or if I'm just really an Appian supporter and follower, I can see all of this content. I think this is one that I'm going to share with people who ask. Absolutely. You know, and, and gonna, some of our donors and whatnot. Absolutely. So. Yeah, and you're not going to see on that schedule, you know, day four was spa day. And, exactly, uh, you're not going to see. You know, no, you're, you're going to see evidence of of a hardworking team who put their heart and soul into this thing absolutely. and i'm speaking for 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 everyone absolutely and uh and we hope we hope that conversations like this help you appreciate the work you all are letting us do yeah we're glad to do it we don't want to ever indicate that we're we're discontented yeah we'll communicate to you openly and honestly when there are challenges how god allowed us to to work through those things lessons we learned mistakes we made um, but at the end of the day we pray that god is glorified with these efforts and uh, these things that that so many of you um, have allowed us to do throughout this season of inroads we'll continue highlighting others that are using digital media to spread the good news of the gospels and we'll pull the curtain back on out of egypt and talk with various members of our own team as we developed, fundraised, and produce our most ambitious, challenging, and rewarding project that we've ever done. That's next time on Inroads. Inroads is a production of Appian Media. We're a non-profit video production company that is 100% crowdfunded. If you're interested in learning more about how you can support Appian Media so we can continue to create more great free content, visit us at appianmedia.org.